Hello and welcome back to this episode of Cloud with Chris. You're with me, Chris Reddington, and we'll be talking about all things cloud. The past few weeks and months have been a strange time for us all, so please continue to stay safe and healthy. I hope that these podcast episodes are providing you a little bit of variety and something different in the day-to-day. Now don't forget that you can listen to these on your favourite platforms, whether that is cloudwithchris.com, Google Play Music, iTunes, Pocket Cast, Spotify, Stitcher or YouTube. So let's start talking about episode number six. Joining me in this episode is Thomas Maurer, a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft who engages with the community and customers all around the world. Most of the focus so far in Cloud with Chris has been on public cloud. So Thomas and I adjust course slightly and talk about hybrid cloud and the new and upcoming features of the Microsoft Azure platform. Get ready to be introduced to a wide variety of Azure technologies and how they may be able to strengthen your on-premises, public cloud or multi-cloud deployments. Let's listen in. Hi everyone and welcome back to another episode of Cloud with Chris. Now we're continuing that discussion of cloud, but we're going to be thinking about a different type of cloud this time. Lots of us think about public cloud, some of us may have heard about private cloud, but there's this also grey area in the middle called hybrid cloud, where we think about maybe our on-premises or maybe even multi-cloud, for example, could be another scenario of hybrid. And it's one of those areas that I'd like to explore today. And I'm very glad to be joined by uh, another colleague at Microsoft, uh, Thomas Maurer. So Thomas is one of the senior cloud advocates at Microsoft. Uh, He engages communities across the world. And uh, he's recently joined Azure Engineering. Beforehand, he actually was a lead architect and a Microsoft MVP and very familiar with these kind of hybrid cloud architectures and these hybrid cloud deployments. So I'm delighted today to be joined by Thomas. Thomas, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Hello, Chris, and thank you very much for um, having me at your podcast. Really appreciate it. No, very glad to have you here. Thank you for coming. So one of the things I want to dive straight into here, starting to define what we mean by hybrid cloud, because some people might be thinking hybrid cloud as private and public, But there are, I guess, other scenarios, right? Like multi-cloud, for example. So maybe if we start thinking about what you see come up. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I really think that's a great thing to start at. And um, yeah, if if we talk, a lot of people know about private cloud uh, and their on-prem environment. And then... Um, having the public cloud. Uh, And there was this thing in between, which we called hybrid cloud, or which we still call hybrid cloud. And this is absolutely still the case, right? Uh, This is absolutely still there. Uh, However, since like kind of like during the Ignite 2019 timeframe, we changed our messaging a little bit in terms of that hybrid is not just like something in between uh, using on-prem and and Azure. Hybrid can also be um, if you use multi-cloud environments, right? So wherever you basically run your systems and your uh, services, this can be in your data center, it can be at a service provider, it can be like in your factories or your retail stores or at the edge or again another cloud provider right and i think that is really like important for people to understand that we're really going going in that direction and we're really hitting that as one one state of of doing cloud right so hybrid cloud is this idea that you might be running on azure but you also might be running wherever it makes sense for you to go and run your workload. We're not going to define where that is. You're going to define that based upon whatever your requirements are. So if you've got, like you mentioned, some kind of manufacturing scenario, you might have some factories, some warehouses that have IoT devices and you need to run certain things on the edge very close to what you're doing. But then you have some kind of processing that happens back in the cloud or maybe on premises or maybe even another cloud because you've got some kind of requirement that drives you across multiple clouds and it's all part of that hybrid and multi-cloud idea that I understood. So maybe let's pick up on that point of requirements. Are there certain themes, certain trends, certain requirements maybe that 
you see across different organizations that you work with that drive them towards some of these technologies maybe? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, so I think one important thing is which which is very important and um, a lot of customers hear us or especially Microsoft and also other cloud vendors obviously talk a lot about cloud. But for me, it was very important when Jason Sanders, which is basically the engineering lead of Microsoft Azure, um, went on stage um, and did one of the Microsoft Ignite keynotes and said that, we think that, or we believe that hybrid is an end state for our customers, right? It's not an in-between state until everything is moved to the cloud. It really is like we see the need of customers uh, having using the cloud, taking the advantage of the cloud and running a lot of services there. But we really see that, again, that you have needs, right? Um, for example, in a way that, you run services in a factory, right? You don't want probably have, have a dependencies on a internet connection to your cloud provider. And if the internet goes down, your whole factory stands still. Um, so you want to probably be like, okay, hey, I'm running the factory, I'm running IoT workloads, I'm running server workloads in that factory, and I'm sending my data on later to to Azure, to the cloud, to do like further processing or backups and whatever you do there. But I don't have a like a depend direct dependency on the cloud in that case. So that is definitely one of the uh, large hybrid use cases we are seeing. The other one I would say I see a lot is that you actually are running on-prem, like you're an enterprise which runs workloads on-prem. Uh, you already have everything in place, but now you start to take advantage of certain cloud services, right? So this can be, for example, disaster recovery and backup, where you can go out and, and just use Azure as a disaster recovery site for your data center, um, or that you store your long-term backups in Azure. And then we have a couple of other like very interesting management services, which you can use to basically make your on-prem uh, environment and or again if I, I should say if your hybrid environment not just including on-prem but also multi-cloud environment even better using Azure. Nice nice and I've got to put a call back there to uh, one of the things you said in the beginning which was around the uh, the large hybrid use case the direct dependencies and not depending on cloud for your uh, hybrid workload. I'm going to say hybrid, not on-premises, uh, but let's go back to that factory scenario and that idea that maybe you have uh, some workload that if the connection between the factory and the data center in Azure or whatever cloud provider goes down, for example, um, then you can then you have that business continuity, you have that ongoing operations. And that is so important. And I just really want to emphasize again that requirements really drive that decision, right? It's not just a case of, oh, you're in, in this workload and you're in this industry and you're doing this thing that suddenly XYZ is suddenly the right thing for you. You need to really understand your business needs, understand what the damage potentially is, for example, if that link goes down and just understand how the business can continue. And that's so important. And I think we've spoken about one of those things in a previous podcast, which is this idea of a failure mode analysis and this idea of being able to look through the whole solution, not just the cloud aspects, but end to end, you know, whether that's in the factory, in the public cloud, in another cloud or in the edge, if something fails, what is the impact of that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And um, I mean, this is like what you should always look at your workloads, right? And you brought it up in, in a way that you have to look at it for like dependencies and like making sure that things are running, but also in a way that you need to figure out um, how can I make things better using the cloud, right? Or are things maybe better if I don't run them in the cloud and maybe closer to my customers, right? Um, there are definitely like different concepts. And, and when I look at it, I basically think that if you very high level look at hybrid today, um, and you correct me if I, maybe I'm missing there or something, but um, I, there are basically two two large concepts. One is basically connecting workloads which you run currently again on prem uh, or at the edge uh, to the cloud and make them better, 
or basically bringing cloud services down to your environment uh, to basically like like on, on, on places where you can't run the cloud, right? If you think about cruise ships with no internet connectivity or you have some regulations on compliance scenarios where you can't really run services outside of your country and you don't have an Azure data center in your country, then there are also good reasons to have that. And I think, I think we are one of the only cloud providers, or if not the only one who have, has a serious solution there with Azure Stack, with our Azure Stack portfolio, but not limited to that, but like where we can actually allow you to run Azure services uh, in your in your data center or at the, your location, wherever you need them. There's two pieces to that. And I think let's maybe start with the first aspect that you talked about, which is the idea of bringing cloud innovation to your on-premises, because you don't necessarily need to use uh, cloud deployments and actually deploy things in the cloud to benefit from the cloud. When I think of the Azure suite of technologies that is out there, you know, things like uh, Azure Backup absolutely work with an on-premises or nearby environment, let's say, to our uh, users. But then also things like Azure Update Management, where maybe we need to go and manage some updates on machines, for example, or even some of the newer, shinier things that are coming out, like Azure Arc. You know, I, maybe let's speak about Azure Arc a bit later or, or in a moment, but Azure Arc is one of these great technologies which is really actually being driven because of the cloud and because of the nature of the scale that we typically need to operate in the cloud. But it now opens up this brand new opportunity for these environments that might be either on-premises or indeed, like you say, in other clouds as well. Yeah, so you're absolutely right there. This is like... Um, the Azure Arc piece and and in connecting these services um, to Azure that gives a real immediately like a benefit to to when you start using these right. Um, it's not about just like hey we want you to move everything to the cloud. No no no. We really want to make sure that you have the best solution whatever you need to do. And um, we understand that you need to run stuff on prem. Um, and you can make it better using our services. And I, I'm I'm super like excited about Azure Arc. We ha- in Azure we have this great thing called the Azure Resource Manager, right? And Azure Resource Manager offers you basically all these cool things like like these these logical things like Azure uh, Resource Groups, tagging, uh, stuff like RBAC, and all basically all of that, right? And Today, we use that to organize and manage our deployments in Azure. Uh, so that was like all the Azure services. Basically, if you interact with Azure, you either use the portal, the CLI, PowerShell, or some APIs. But at the end, you're interacting with that Azure Resource Manager. And that one does really take care of deploying these services and managing these services. If you have ever worked with that, you see the benefit of this Azure Resource Manager. And now the question really came up with like, hmm, can we not just use these the, the Azure Resource Manager to basically manage um, services and servers and Kubernetes clusters and, and a lot of other things which are do not run in Azure, right? Why not extend the Azure Resource Manager um, to allow us to manage other resources as well. And that is really what Azure Arc is. It basically extends the possibility of Azure Resource Manager to manage services which run um, outside of Azure. Understood. I'm equally excited about Azure Arc as well. I think this idea of management at scale is really well understood, well uh, attacked, I suppose, with Azure Arc, and it's really well taken as a problem because I love some of the demos that they've done. I think it was, I think it was at the previous Ignite actually where they did this. Um, they showed the whole idea of uh, a Kubernetes cluster that you can stand up, and maybe that Kubernetes cluster was a uh, a retail bank, for example, and you might have hundreds of retail banks across the country, and to bring a new retail bank online, all you need to do is just enroll the Kubernetes cluster with Azure Arc. It identifies that it has the appropriate policies and whatnot, and then basically does itself like a self-install, and you've got a new branch online and ready to go. And when you think of that power that that then enables, that's just awesome, 
it's it's really exciting when you think that technology can start unfolding some of these new scenarios. Yeah, yeah, I, I really agree with that. It's like it's like uh, kind of like a matching, and I'm sure <laughs> you you deal a lot with our customers when you're working in the in the fast track program, um, where you have these customers which are um, doing this hybrid architecture, right? Uh, where they say, "Hey, I want like this application." Um, runs partly in the cloud, but partly also uh, on-premises. Um, and I want to deploy that like multiple times and very, very quickly. And now, since you have everything connected to Azure and this Azure Resource Manager, you just go out, you deploy an ARM template, you deploy, deploy the resources, and you can set up that environment, that application, as like uh, in one go, right? And it's not not just about okay, I need to deploy something in Azure and I need to deploy something on-prem. Now you can basically use the same deploy, the same mechanisms or the same control. Let's put it, let's use the word control for that um, uh, to manage these resources. And absolutely the example you brought up there with their, like the bank um, and connecting a new Kubernetes cluster, this is just, this is just like, kind of like mind blowing, right? You can think about also a retail store uh, where they run containerized apps and and then on a Kubernetes cluster, and they basically just have to build a hard, take a hardware piece, and we can talk a little bit about what that hardware piece can be in a bit. But you take that hardware piece, you have a Kubernetes cluster on there, and as soon as it comes online, it connects to Azure using Azure Arc, and it gets all the configuration policies down. It gets all the application policies down to that Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and spins it up, right? Absolutely. And I think just to be clear for anyone listening who has an understanding in Kubernetes and is thinking, hold on, I, I can do that with normal Kubernetes because manifests, Helm charts, all these things are just transferable. The real benefit and the real value in what Azure Arc is doing is having, as we've really been hinting here, this central management pane, this central management platform and this ability to be able to just point a cluster to a specific configuration and what it's doing in the background is using GitOps. And maybe that's something we can explore in another episode, for example. But it's it's using that idea of GitOps and allowing the cluster to register itself to a particular configuration store, which is like a repository of some sort. And then because you're not having to push those changes out to brand new clusters, or sign up new clusters and push them out to your DevOps pipeline. It just does it using GitOps. So it's a very, very clever way to help us scale some of that management, which let's face it, sometimes the management side of things isn't the most fun of things to do from a technology perspective. You know, we just want to get things running so we can keep building the fun and shiny things, keep the lights on and, uh, you know, work on the biggest and greatest innovation that uh, we're going for next. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is abs- you, you. You absolutely nailed it with 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 that. And I think also for people who have never heard about Azure Arc, um, I think when we we now talked a lot about like Kubernetes, but Azure Arc is not just for containers and Kubernetes, right? As of today, we can also connect like just standard servers, right? This can be Linux servers, this can be Windows servers. So you can also push down like configuration policies basically to your servers, wherever they are running, um, using like Azure guest configuration policies uh, to like, for example, one of the great things I saw, like one of the demos we are having and and doing is um, like figuring out, hey, which servers are having insecure password settings, right? We could use that policy before for Azure machines are running or servers running in Azure but now we can basically use them for service running anywhere, right? And and then the third part, which we which was announced during Ignite as well, was the data services part, and and that part is a little bit different from from the other two, it's basically because we with the Kubernetes part and the server part, you are basically connecting your existing resources or newly deployed resources to Azure. With the data services part, we basically give you the capabilities to take Azure SQL and Azure Postgres to basically let you run that wherever you need it, right? So you get basically Azure services, which you can put into your data center um, because a lot of customers told us, hey, Azure SQL is amazing. It's great. We, we want to use it for, for our, our data. However, 
we have these scenarios and we think we're coming back to what we discussed earlier. We have it like we run a factory or we have a place where we just where there are regulations in place where we can't really give it into an Azure data center because you're probably not in the same country or, or whatever the reason is. But this allows you just to take these Azure data services to run Azure SQL like wherever you need it, right? And I think that that is also pretty cool. Right. I guess I'm showing my hand a little bit here, you know, talking so much on the Kubernetes side. I'm an app dev at heart. So, uh, you know, I'll keep focusing on that, but you, you're right, completely right there, completely right. Virtual machines, the SQL side, the database side, absolutely. You know, those are other areas where you can focus on from uh, Azure Arc as well. There was one thing in there that you mentioned there, which was about being able to put things inside of your data center. Uh, You mentioned that from the database side with like Azure database for uh, SQL or whichever service, for example. Maybe let's pick up on that a bit more because I guess Arc is just one way that you could potentially do that. There are plenty of other ways as well because, and it's probably one that is more well-known, I would say, uh, because it's been around a little bit longer, but we've got this family of products, this this suite almost that... uh, Uh, revolves around this Azure Stack portfolio. So uh, maybe let's talk a bit more about Azure Stack. Yeah, absolutely. And and I mean, before we we start talking about Azure Stack, I just want to quickly point out, you're absolutely right. I mean, the thing with with also the the Azure Data Services part, uh, the way we get those Azure Data Services and Azure SQL down is basically in containers. So our customers, if they want to run Azure Data Services using Azure Arc, they will need to have a Kubernetes cluster somewhere, uh, and that's how we bring it down. So that's super exciting for you, I guess. Well, also <laughs> for me, right? <laughs> exactly. See, I told you, Kubernetes is the way. Kubernetes is the way. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Azure Stack, you know, slightly different to Azure Arc because Azure Arc, we've really been talking about bringing some of those management benefits that we've realized from public cloud. But Azure Stack really takes all of that one layer further, doesn't it? Yes, absolutely. So Azure Stack really got a big, big push as well. Uh, in the, I mean, it's it's there for a while. I think the first time it was announced uh, was back at Ignite in 2015. I remember that. I think it was in Chicago where they first publicly talked about it. And mm. since then, it really evolved. Uh, as you said, it kind of like became this family of, of products and um it's it's like when we go back to that example where you basically have a new um, branch office or or a factory or um, the store you're t- we were talking about, you still need some hardware right somewhere, and there there is where Azure Stack the Azure Stack family comes in. Uh, currently, we have three different products or services, if you will. We have the Azure Stack Hub, which was renamed from like which was the original Azure Stack, and this one was then renamed to Azure Stack Hub. And this scenario is really about bringing basically Azure into your on-prem environment, right? It really is a small, inst- if you will, a small instance of Azure, allowing you to run, uh, having an Azure portal, having the Azure Resource Manager, uh, having Azure services um, in your data center. And it enables a lot of different scenarios, which we can speak in a bit. And then we have two other things. Uh, We have Azure Stack um, HCI, which is our hyper-converged solution, which is basically validated hardware, which we took to work together with our OEMs. And you can go from very small two-node clusters up to very powerful 16-node clusters, and then obviously span that over multiple clusters if you need to. And uh, basically run virtual machines, right? As you would do for that. And then the last one, which was uh, added to the Azure Stack family was Azure Stack Edge. And that was basically, if you probably were familiar with, um, or the listeners here were familiar with Databox Edge. And basically we renamed Databox Edge to Azure Stack Edge and gave it, gave him like announced a couple of new capabilities there uh, back at Ignite. And what it does, it's a first party uh, server unit, which you can order from Azure using the pay as you go model. And you put it in wherever you need it and it runs containers. There is the, is again, right? So you can run, it runs a Kubernetes, you can run Kubernetes on top of it. And then 
um, or you will. That was one of the announcements which which we made there, uh, and this then enables you to run like um, AI and machine learning services right at the edge. Right, it comes with super fast storage. So think about when you have collect a large amount of data uh, and you push that to 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 the Azure Stack Edge. And then you run container uh, like services inside containers to basically analyze this using machine learning. And then later on, you basically just replicate it to Azure, for example, uh, as the long-term storage. So we have like really cool products there as well. You're making my job as an interviewer both really easy and really hard because there's so many things that you just said there. I'm thinking, oh, I want to explore that. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about this. Um, And let's first talk about one of the things you mentioned there that with Azure Stack as as a portfolio, really what you're doing is you are deploying a small instance of Azure is how you worded it. And I completely agree because when you look at it, even things like Azure Resource Manager templates, they still translate and you can deploy using the same approach that you use, no matter whether it's Azure, you know, Azure Commercial, whether it's Azure Gov or one of those sovereign clouds, or even your own deployment of Azure Stack as well. You've got that same translatable, same transferable deployment approach as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, and this is this is exactly where we put it in, right? For where I have seen customers doing this for different purposes. Um, one which I call the like kind of like the technical use case is when when the, the when there when the internet connectivity is just not there or it's just not good enough, and you have too much latency for the application to run. Uh, in an Azure data center, you can use an Azure Stack Hub and bring it closer to uh, your users or your application or wherever you need it. Right. Um, the second one really is about like regulations and and being aware of that. So some parts, like some companies, they have regulations that they can't store data outside of their country or even outside of their data center, and so. This allows them basically uh, like a solution for for that and still run not just VMs, right? We're not talking about the big benefit for Azure Stack Hub is not that it can run just VMs. It can run like app services. It can run uh, other uh, other Azure services uh, as well. So you have that kind of like similar, well, you have a similar deployment model using the Azure Resource Manager, as you just mentioned. And then the third one really is like where I've seen, and I, I never really believed in that one until I saw it and I heard it from so many customers, was that cloud modernization, right? So they basically, customers who said, okay, hey, we want to go to the cloud and we want to take advantage of the cloud deployment model and we want to take advantage of these cloud services and pass and all of that and doing infrastructure as code and all, but we are not ready yet. We, we don't have like uh, so many things not in place to use the public cloud, um, but we want to do that. And then Azure Stack, basically Azure Stack Hub gives them the, the, the same thing as they would run in Azure, but without actually leaving their data center, right? And I've really running Azure under their terms. And I think that is that is what, a, like, those three reasons are, are very good reasons for Azure Stack Hub. Absolutely. It's that dipping the toe in the water, isn't it? It's preparing for that potential cloud move later on. Or even, in fact, you know what? You don't need to move later on. You can carry on running where you are because you're still getting the same benefits. You're still using the same deployment models. And if you do decide to go to public cloud a little bit later, um, you know, requirements allow you later on, then great. Just use the same deployment model, use the same concepts that you've learned and deploy into the public cloud. Lovely idea, lovely concept. I, I also had, I mean, that goes into like one, had a, I was talking to one of our customers um, recently. I think it was before I joined Microsoft. And the requirement they had, they said, hey, look, we're going to move all of our websites into Azure. And we are absolutely fine with that. Uh, However, we have this internal regulation. So what we have is a product which we launch one time a year. And we have this internal regulations which says, hey, nothing about that product can leave our facility. Not even like, it's just, just a rule. You can tell them like, hey, Azure is super secure and everything. 
Uh, they don't. They really don't care about that. It's really just about there is one rule and nothing about that product leaves the facility. So they said, okay, hey, we're going to prepare that launch website um, in our data center, but we want to have the same deployment method where you want to use the same thing as we then would run in Azure, right? Because in Azure, we're using uh, PaaS services. We're taking advantage of app service and stuff like that. So we also need that to, to run in our data center. And so they they take basically Azure Stack Hub and they're working on their secret project and, and their launch website on Azure Stack Hub. And as soon as they're ready to publish that, they basically publish it in Azure um, at the, the specific date. So uh, that's another, like from when, when I when I heard about this, that was like, okay, that, that really makes a lot of sense. Gotcha. Nice. Yeah, that's another uh, interesting use case there. Excellent. Excellent. So let's maybe expand into some of the other areas. We've talked about Hub a little bit there. Um, Azure Stack HCI, we mentioned about uh, the ability to run containers and things on there as well and have some edge compute almost there. And I love that idea again. Why do we need to worry about sending things up to the cloud when we can maybe do some pre-computation of things locally where it's closer and get that response back so much quicker? Love that idea. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is this is really like the key, right? Uh, and and it's not just about like a nice to have option. It's also in some scenarios, it's really critical, right? Uh, <laughs> we were discussing about like if you do face face recognition and and things like that, um, then you sometimes really need to have a fast response, right? Or if you like measuring something in the factory floor. You don't want to spend like like 10, 20 seconds basically getting mm. back an answer from the cloud. You want to react really, really quickly. And that mm. is exactly what we're allowed to do with Azure Stack Edge. Absolutely. It's it's almost thinking about those potential health and safety scenarios, right? Whether there's like a, um, a security issue or whether there is, like you mentioned in the warehouse, like a spillage or some kind of accident. Those extra seconds could be crucial, could mean life or death. So having that ability to deploy, again, that same model in the same way, closer to where your users are and the actual application is, that's an amazing offering, an amazing idea. So love that. Yeah, absolutely. And and as you said, I mean, now the great thing here, <laughs> if you think about it, we have that, we have these hardware appliances, right? We have Azure Stack Hub, we have Azure Stack HCI, we have Azure Stack Edge, and now we, if you think back and we talked about Azure Arc, and if you combine those things together, uh, you get basically an, an amazing solution. So think about you put in your Azure Stack Edge in your store, in your factory, uh, you spin up that Kubernetes clusters, it connects up using Azure Arc, it connects to Azure, um, co connects to the policies and basically gets down these policies and configures itself and deploys the application as you said, using like GitOps and, and things like that. It's just like, it gives us so much power, right? Absolutely. And I think the, the key word that keeps coming back here is scale, isn't it? It's the management of scale idea with Azure Arc, the deployment at scale idea, whether it's um, on public cloud or whether it's on something like uh, Azure Stack Hub or one of the products from the Azure Stack portfolio, there's this idea of being able to have this universal deployment plane and this universal management plane it, it's it's really exciting because i think so many times in industry we learn one thing and then we have to relearn it and relearn it because that model has slightly changed over time uh, new technology has come in but what we're doing is saying actually this was good enough for public cloud this is good enough for us to do uh, in this hybrid scenario as well so let's bring the best of that bring it back and reinvest it in this new scenario as well and i think one of the areas maybe we've neglected a little bit whilst we've been talking here, but it's also things like the IoT side of things. We've kept talking about edge. And there's also this concept of IoT edge as well. And once again, this this similar theme that seems to be keep cropping back up is this idea of containers. And IoT edge, once again, works in the exact same way. This idea that you can go ahead, deploy containers to uh, those particular IoT devices running IoT edge, and again, run it literally on the device. And 
when you start thinking of all these different offerings we've talked about, whether it's IoT Edge, whether it's Azure, H- Azure Stack HCI, uh, Azure Stack Hub, or even public cloud, there's so many points there then that you can start deploying your workloads. And it gets quite interesting and exciting, the different use cases you can start unlocking there. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I like can't stress this enough. And I think what also is very important, what we have to realize is it's it's just there to to enable new scenarios. And you can say, hey, we could do things like this before without the cloud, right? Uh, yes, that's probably. But think about the complexity you were building up uh, by just like having like building all those network connectivity things you needed to build, right? Uh, <laughs> and like for example, you had to have VPNs or whatever you had to like from all your branch offices or stores or whatever and i remember that i had a customer once where they connected all their the retail stores basically back and i don't know they managed like 200 vpn connections which again probably there are people out managing much much more but that was already a big effort out there and to build just that base infrastructure to make this all happening they spend a ton of manpower and resources. And now with that move to the cloud, it really like brings us to a higher level where we can like, we as IT, in, in the case of IT administrators or IT engineers or developers, we can basically focus on what really matters. We can start man- like improving the application experience or the application itself. And I think, get an easier management and focus more on things like security as well, right? I think that is also very important because I I mean, when I, when, when I think a couple of years back, I always said, hey, people are not really thinking about security. They are happy when things are running, right? They are just happy when, when the application or the platform works, but they didn't even spend that time to basically build a secure infrastructure uh, or environment. And now... Now, basically, by giving them, hey, here is the thing. It's easy to set up. It's easy to connect. Um, now you and, and it's basically the base. It's it's secure, um, design, like designed by default. Um, but now you can focus on security on your environment uh, or on your application. I think that that's a huge benefit. Yeah, a, a ton that people can be listening in and uh, thinking, okay, these are different options for me to consider here. So maybe to start wrapping us up here, Let's think about some of those people who maybe are at the beginning of their journey, whether that's beginning of cloud or listening to this and thinking, actually, I've got a really great use case for hybrid cloud. We've talked about things like site recovery, backup and update management, for example, where you can go ahead and use those with your on-premises environment or other clouds or public cloud, wherever that may be. Uh, We've talked about things like Uh, Azure Stack portfolio, so things like Azure Stack Hub, HCI, and Edge, where you can actually go and deploy a cloud in your own environment. And then things like Azure Arc, where you can scale that management side of things as well. So bringing that all together, what would you say are maybe some of the top things that should be on these people's minds? What are maybe some of the tips and tricks and some of the observations that you've had where you've worked with other organizations along that journey? Yeah, there's... As as from our podcast right now, you can like, you can imagine there is so much going on and it's so hard to basically say everyone what's to do. But if I can recommend like what I would do if I like would start seeing the, the opportunities and the things we have here and we talked about here, I would recommend like start small, right? Don't go and like try to say, hey, look, I want to change everything we are doing today and and just like. Because like if you do that, you build this large scale project and you have so many dependencies and you're more likely to fail. My tip really is start small, start with like whatever is like top in your list. Like for example, managing updates for your service, right? Across your environment. Uh, in that case, have a look at Azure Update Management and start having a look at it and start implementing that and see how it works and what the benefit will be. This can also be just for backup or whatever you need, right? We talked about site recovery as well. Um, Start with something you can actually handle and you can actually get a benefit very, very quickly. And then you can see, hey, that worked great and you will learn a lot about it. You will learn a lot about how how to work with the cloud and um, how to like basically interact and you will see what, what you need to think of and you will learn that. 
and then you can move on to the next thing, right? Don't go out and just, I mean, you can create that vision in your head and say, hey, that would be the perfect world. We would do this, but let's start small um, by just doing one thing and, and, and learning from this. I think that would be my, my tip. Excellent. And I have to say it as well. I'm sensing lots of themes here uh, that align from a DevOps perspective as well. We, a few episodes ago, we had Abel Wang come in and talk about uh, his DevOps journey, I suppose. And there was something you mentioned earlier about uh, allowing people to focus on growing their applications, building better applications, being able to focus on security and these other things. And I think it's that idea of delivering value to end users, that idea of starting small, working in an agile way, iterating over that, building, growing, learning, and being able to deliver that value to end users. There's so many similarities and synergies there from a DevOps perspective as well. So really great to hear that guidance and really great to hear that feedback. So Thomas, I think uh, there's absolutely plenty of information in there for folks listening to go and dwell over to think about. So I'm sure no doubt that we'll have to discuss this in a bit more detail, maybe some of the things that evolve over time with some of these services and maybe jump into a little more depth perhaps in some of those industries and some of those scenarios that uh, that we've talked about there. So Thomas, a big thank you from me. Thank you for joining the show today. Uh, it's been a great pleasure having you here. Thank you very much, Chris. And we should definitely do that. Wow. I mentioned in the intro that you would be introduced to a variety of Azure technologies that may be relevant to on-premises, cloud, or multi-cloud deployments. And I think that was well and truly covered. A big thank you again to Thomas for joining and sharing his brilliant knowledge in this area. I would love to hear how you're finding these episodes and if I can make these any more valuable for you. Please do get in touch, either on Facebook or Twitter at Cloud with Chris, if you have any feedback. And as always, if you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to provide a like or subscribe on whichever platform you've been listening in on. If you think it might be useful for your own followers or connections, please do share onwards. Thanks once again for listening in, and until next time, goodbye.